On the banks of the River Dee, Chester is deservedly one of the UK's top tourist destinations. Here you can walk a complete circuit around its Roman and medieval walls and gaze down upon its Roman amphitheatre. Its imposing cathedral dates back to 1093, only a few years after the Norman conquest, whilst its attractive black and white architecture has been well preserved, as have its unique covered shopping rows, and its race course established in 1539, is the oldest in the world still in operation. Equally fascinating, but far less well known, is Chester's industrial heritage. A good place to see some of the highlights is by taking a short walk along Chester's Canal Corridor. Here to guide us is Stuart Shuttleworth, author of the recent publication, Chester at Work. Although Chester didn't see the explosion in industrial development that the South Lancashire towns did, industry was still a significant, if rather understated, part of the city's economy. In medieval times, the markets and the craft industries were thriving throughout the town. In these few images we demonstrate the breadth of industry throughout the history of Chester. Starting in medieval times we see the influence of the guilds and view the river as a workplace. In contrast we move through the centuries to view groundbreaking 20th century industries. I think of the focus of industry moving with time. Following the Norman conquest, the river was the focus, providing power and transport. In the 18th century, the focus moved to the canal corridor. In the 19th century, the railway area was the centre, and with the development of road transport in the 20th century, industry became much more widespread. Today we're going to concentrate on the industrial development along the Canal Corridor. The tranquil waters of the canal through Chester mask a turbulent early history. In 1766 a bill for the Trent and Mersey Canal went to Parliament. It was to be the Grand Trunk Canal, advocated by no less than Josiah Wedgwood. The merchants of Chester immediately saw the threat. At a time of great industrial growth, Chester would be bypassed and traffic diverted from the Dee to the Mersey. Local worthies got together and had a Canal Act by 1772. The plan was to join the Trenton Mersey at Middlewich. However, they inserted a clause preventing the Chester from joining their canal. Plans had to change. The canal was built from Chester to Nantwich by 1779. Fortunes for the canal in the early years were very mixed. There was some early traffic, agricultural products, packet boats from Beeston, but not sufficient to sustain a new canal. Salvation eventually came in the form of the Ellesmere Canal Company of 1791. Their grand scheme was to link the Seven at Shrewsbury with the Mersey taking an independent route. They built the great aqueducts at Pontisalti and Chirk, a section near Frude and the Wirral line to Ellesmere Port. The coffers, however, ran dry before completion and they had to seek compromise. The Ellesmere already had a branch to Whitchurch, not a great distance from the Chester Canal near Nantwich. Negotiations were protracted, but eventually the link was opened in 1805. Traffic from the mineral-rich Traver area could reach the Mersey by means of the Chester Canal, 
Finally, fortunes looked up for both companies. Our walk today begins at the Cow Lane Bridge, taking its name from the cattle market that once backed onto here. The pub opposite incorporates an old warehouse and stands on the site of the wharf. There was a steam sawmill and timber yard linked by a canal arm to the left of the pub, occupying what is now a Tesco superstore. These old images show that the wharf specialised in the handling of salt and timber. Looking up from Cow Lane, we see how the canal became Chester's industrial corridor. The area changed radically in the 1960s. The next bridge carries a section of the Inner Ring Road, St Elsel's Way, which allowed greater commuting for work. Once under St Oswald's Way, this would have been the scene in the late 19th century. A canal boat, known locally as a flat, discharges at Wiseman's Corn Mill, now repurposed as the Mill Hotel. Following the repeal of the Corn Laws in the 1840s, with steam power available, half a dozen mills grinding grain for flour and animal feed were built along the canal here. By the First World War, however, the local industry was in decline due to technical changes and a harder type of grain being imported. We now come to the elegant Union Bridge built in the 1820s. On the bridge columns, you can see the gouges made by the tow ropes from the time boats were pulled by horses. From Union Bridge, we get a tantalizing view of the steam mill. It was built by the Frost family in stages between the 1830s and the 1870s. They'd moved from D Mills on the river in 1819 to an old canal side cotton mill. In 1881 they installed the first automated roller mill in the UK which could process the harder wheat being imported from North America. Transshipment from ship to canal flat added to costs, so in 1910 they relocated to Ellesmere Port. The building was then taken over by Milne Seeds, who used a blown air seed transport system inside. The Frost Office Building of 1891 is still seen at the rear of the old building. Crossing Union Bridge, we take a right. Down the lane we come across a small canal side park commemorating Chester's lead industry. Situated in it is a sculpture in stainless steel and blue glass called Spears of Reflection. Its creator, Ed Snell, was inspired by and explains the functioning of the lead shot tower. City Road was laid out and this bridge built in the mid-1860s to create a more formal and befitting approach to both the city and Chester's General Station. Initially Chester's Grand Station was accessed through the cattle market and allotments. Failing to provide the grand and prestigious link to which the city fathers aspired. In the 19th century, many small foundries operated in towns and cities in the UK. The Edgerton Iron and Brass Foundry, operated by James Mall, was just such a one. Towards the end of the century, foundries became larger and therefore fewer, but with greater levels of engineering skills. In City Road, the shoe factory of Messrs Collinson, Gilbert & Co was built in the 1860s in the style of 40 years earlier. It was described as housing vast amounts of machinery and employing 250 hands who turned out two to 3,000 pairs of boots a week. Around 1875, the factory was taken over by Alfred Bostock & Co, a Stafford shoe firm until 1892. The premises were then occupied by Mr. Harker, rope, twine manufacturer and chandler who has lent his name to the current pub. Walkers and Maltby set up the lead works on the bank of the canal in the 1780s. 
the works were to become the biggest manufactory in Chester and continue in production for 200 years. The Napoleonic Wars stimulated the building of a shop tower for the manufacture of pistol balls. In the tower, molten lead is passed through a sieve to form drops and allowed to fall. During the fall, they become spherical and are solidified as they plunge into a vessel of water at the bottom. The availability of transport was a vitally important factor in deciding the location of the new works. Eventually there were railway sidings connecting with the crew line. This mooring ring is a reminder that the lead works once had its own fleet of carrying boats. This modern boat woman won't have much space for lead ingots. Retracing our steps we head towards the Union Vaults, a reminder that the Chester Canal eventually became part of the Shropshire Union Canal system. We'll now take a walk down Edgerton Street. It was built speculatively in 1820 by the developer Thomas Lunt together with Union Bridge. One of the first things we notice is a metal rain gutter. Clearing away the weeds we can see it's made by Lansley's, a local iron founder in Chester. Founded around 1869, the firm started in a small way in George Street, grew modestly in the 19th century by exploiting opportunities in the region. Further down Edgerton Street, this school was built on the site of James Mall's foundry, where the metalwork for City Road Bridge was made. Given their proximity to the lead works, it's hardly surprising that they specialised in making manufacturing equipment for that industry. The nice terracotta date panel on the school shows that the foundry had been demolished soon into the 1900s. A little way along the street we arrive at what had been another sawmill. It incorporated offices at the street end and works with an arcaded ground floor at the rear. Built in the mid 19th century and using steam power it was occupied by paint manufacturers in 1906. Good to see that today it provides a base for modern companies. Turning into Brook Street, we pass Maltby's Carpet Shop. This was Lansley's works. In the 1880s, they took over this former trap tannery and converted it. Note that the original frontage is still very much the same. Lansley's dealt with an extremely wide variety of jobs, ranging from repairing mangles to supplying three steam shunting engines for the Indian Railways. They continued working on this site into the late 1960s. Turning left into Francis Street, we would have found until recently the works of the Hydraulic Engineering Company. The Hydraulic is a superlative Chester example of a foundry that has increased its level of engineering skills to become an international industry leader. Its origin was the Flukersbrook Foundry established in 1805. By 1869, Edward Bazand Ellington had become a partner and managing director. He was an engineer who pioneered the development of urban hydraulic power distribution systems. The company went from strength to strength. They powered everything from the London theatres to the docks of places such as Gibraltar, Hong Kong, Calcutta, Melbourne. On top of this, they built a huge range of hydraulic machinery for industry. The hydraulic made a significant contribution to the First World War effort, rewarded by a visit made from King George V and Queen Mary in May 1917. The site on this side of the street is now occupied by a modern apartment block. On the other side of the street it's sad to see that the last remaining building of the hydraulic has recently been demolished. 
Although not a significant building in its own right, it was a tangible reminder, now lost, of a great Chester company. Fortunately, we've seen good examples of industrial buildings that represent Chester's history. It is important, though, to remember the skill, enterprise and endeavour of the working people. The sculpted memorial by the Lead Works, the interpretation board by the Lockkeeper pub and the heritage information leaflets show how this can be done. We now make our way back to the Cow Lane Bridge and back to our starting point to end the tour. Thank you.